her term to me was, it was like a dungeon. I didn't give up what I was looking for. The body was nude and handcuffed behind the back. She was in a fetal position, all turned, stuffed in this bag. I don't think this was the first time he had done something like this. Wondering all this time where she is or what happened. I do believe there are probably other victims. You're listening to True Crime Arizona, the podcast. The couple would spend days busy in their Phoenix paint shops. It was the summer of 1994. Jack and Elaine Court loved each other and loved their jobs. We decided to quit our jobs and go full time into uh, swap mating and then eventually opened up two stores. And so you guys were selling paints, right? Selling paint, brushes, uh, anything to do with, anything to put you to work. Was it often that you'd go up to Prescott and Prescott Valley for swap meets with paint? Yes, we went to Prescott Valley in the summertime because it's basically too hot in Phoenix. But on this trip to Prescott Valley, they met someone new, a quiet man who was also in the paint business. Was he a nice guy from what you could tell? He just seemed like a very normal person. Yeah. But there was something slightly off about him and a moving truck parked in his driveway, enough to make Elaine scribble down a note, a note that would put the courts at the center of a cold case they unknowingly cracked. We came into the office and I only heard him say, a body, a freezer. He said, she's right here. And he said, Detective Masher and Prescott wants to talk to you. And I, looking at him very puzzled, like, what do you talk, what do you mean? Prescott is a small town tucked away in Northern Arizona. There's a town square with old cozy neighborhoods among the hills and large trees. Families all know one another and many know the familiar face of Sheriff Scott Masher. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a very colorful history. This Prescott, this was the capital of Arizona in the territorial days. A lot of history here. It's still that quaint, small town feel. He was a young detective with the Yavapai County Sheriff's Office at the time and got a call that summer day to help out with an investigation involving a moving truck parked on a driveway. I, I was in my office here in Prescott in criminal investigations and I had received a call from one of our deputies who had said that he'd been given information of a stolen vehicle at the Prescott Country Club and that vehicle was a rider rental truck. He had gone out and confirmed that the truck was there uh, and that it was stolen, but he said what was kind of different was there were some electrical cords coming out of the truck that were plugged in to an outlet. So he wasn't sure what was going on inside the truck. Uh, at that time, there were uh, methamphetamine labs, mobile labs that were somewhat popular. So I told him maybe he should have some of the narcotics guys at least check it out. And we cut open the bags and, and the first thing I think I remembered seeing were some handcuffs and hands. And it looked as though the hands were behind the person's back. I felt it was a female just from the manicured fingernails, but you know, I wasn't positive at that point what we had other than there was a body in the freezer. The truck belonged to John Famolaro. He lived in Dewey, Arizona, not far from Prescott Valley, and also sold paint supplies at the swap meet. His stand caught the eyes that day of a couple well known for their paint business in Phoenix, Jack and Elaine. How did you meet John? Who, who met John first and how did you become associated with him? Uh, I went to walking around be at, right after we set up our booth area and uh, saw John selling paint and naturally it caught my attention and I talked to him for a few minutes about uh, 
where he said he had come from California six months earlier and he was painting houses and he had a lot of leftover paint so he decided to come to the swap meet and sell his paint and he had uh, when I mentioned who I who we were he knew about uh, us selling paint out there because we'd been out there for quite a while and we were pretty well known there. Later on Jack went over then he talked to John and, and uh, made a deal with him. I, I don't remember, I don't know how you did that. Well, he had uh, moved all this paint from California back into Prescott and they had a lot of excess colorant, which we used in our business, tinting paint. So he had, I don't know, he said something like three or 4,000 quarts of paint in his backyard. So we made arrangements after the swap meet on Sunday to go to his house and buy some from him. They packed up their supplies and headed up the road to John's house. They noticed right away his backyard was covered in paint supplies, unorganized and unkept. Jack and Elaine waited for him to bring out the paint they'd take back to Phoenix with them. And that's when the rider truck that he had told us he used to move back was sitting alongside of his driveway and grass had grown up six or eight inches around the wheels. So at that point it was kind of obvious that the truck hadn't been turned back in, that, that he was just keeping it. So that was our first indication that there was something that we sh felt we should say something to somebody about the truck. He had told them he moved from California six months ago. Something just didn't feel right. On the way out, I said, I guess I mentioned to, to Elaine, I said, without being obvious, get the numbers on the rider right truck and I think it should be turned back in. He was standing there in the driveway as Jack was backing out, looking right at us, and, but he didn't see me writing because I held it down below the windshield and I was writing down all the information off the truck. What'd you end up yeah. writing down? All, uh, all the trucks have serial numbers on them for identification, so I wrote all that down. Jack and Elaine just thought they're doing the right thing, hoping to get a stolen truck turned back in. So you have all this information about this truck, where do you go with it next? A friend of ours, he was in charge of the stolen vehicle department in Phoenix, and uh, he ha happened to be one of our customers. So he came in and placed a paint order. And during a conversation with Jack, Jack mentioned to him about this uh, suspicion that he had of this rider truck, and turned to me and asked me, do you still have that information? So I pulled it out and gave it to Steve, and he said, okay, he said, I'll call it in. That time, we didn't have cell phones, you only had a beeper. So Steve left and came back the next day to pick up his paint order. While he was there, his beeper went off, and he said, I have a 911 from Prescott. Can I use your telephone? And so he came into the office, and I only heard him say, a body, a freezer. He said, she's right here. And he said, Detective Masher and Prescott wants to talk to you. And I, looking at him very puzzled, like, what do you talk, what do you mean? So I get on the phone and Detective Masher asked me, who are you? My, asked my name and how did I know John Famolaro? And was I going to be in town because they had further questions to ask? And I said, yes, I will be. And that was the end of the conversation. Masher and his team could not believe what they found in this freezer in the back of the truck. There was big black plastic bags in there and you could tell something was in it. He felt those bags and said, I, I believe I feel an arm. A dead woman's body bent into the fetal position, preserved and handcuffed. Investigators had no idea who this woman was. Okay, we have to thaw this body out and try to get a fingerprint or dental records or some way to identify this person. Had you ever dealt with something like that? I mean, to say you had to thaw the body out? No, um, that was something I, I had not dealt with, nor had the medical examiner, the pathologist, nor had the forensic anthropologist. As they began the thawing process, they searched John Famolaro's home. What'd you find inside his house? Well, he was somewhat of a hoarder. Uh, the person who lived at the home was John Joseph Famolaro, and inside the residence uh, we found uh, personal belongings to many other women, driver's license, clothing, other forms of identification, you know, very concerning to us uh, as to what the welfare of these people 
uh, was at that time. The more we searched, uh, we found bloody clothing. We found what we believed to be some weapons, uh, a hammer with uh, blood and what appeared to be tissue on it, pry bar, a nail pry bar with the same uh, appearance of blood and tissue and things on it. Uh, we found other handguns, newspapers of a missing person out of California. Denise Huber. And if I recall correctly, there was a, a fingerprint on the back of her driver's license. Uh, we were able to identify this person as Denise Huber, who had been missing for three plus years. That's when Sheriff Masher made a call he'll never forget to California authorities. I remember when I first called them and said, I have a missing person, and I gave them the name of Denise Huber, they were like, what? It was June of 1991. Denise Huber and her family lived in Newport Beach, California. She was 23 years old, full of life with long brown hair and a warm smile. That night, Denise was going to a summer concert with a friend not too far from home. Her parents, Dennis and Ione, told her goodbye. Well, the last time we saw her, she, was, she got ready to go to the concert. She stuck her head in the door. We were watching television and she just said, I love you both and uh, don't worry about me and she left. She did say it's going to be late and I said, oh, I don't like it when you're late, but you know, she was <laughs> 23 and so she did tell us that. So, you know, I knew she wasn't going to take off and not let us know where she was. But Denise never came home that night after the concert or that next morning. Her parents and friends started looking for her retracing her steps and found her car pulled over on a Newport Beach highway with a flat tire, but no Denise. It's been three days and no one can find 23-year-old Denise Huber. The Newport Beach woman was last seen heading home from a concert. A massive search in Southern California began. Of Denise Huber's disappearance. Large missing person <coughs> banners and billboards were put up, posters hung in nearby towns, but years went by Denise was never found. Her mom and dad were heartbroken. I didn't give up. I was looking for her. Yeah, I had pretty much accepted the fact that she was not coming back. Utter shock ran through Denise Huber's family and friends when her body was found. And miles away in a small Arizona town many had never heard of. None of them in California knew of a John Famolaro, they were certain Denise didn't know him. It was what Sheriff Masher would find inside his home that told the story of how they met on the side of the freeway when Denise's tire went flat after that concert. And then what happened after? Do you think he was impersonating um, an LA law enforcement officer? Yeah, you know, I do. Um, I found what I called an abduction kit. It was a little box that had another pair of handcuffs. It had duct tapes. It had material, cloth material that we, similar to what we found in her mouth that he would gagged her. And so he had this, yeah, it was like a kit that I would think he would keep in his car and take with him. And he had a uh, Los Angeles Sheriff's Office uniform as well that I think he probably used just for that reason. But I remember finding a receipt for a, a rental agreement of a storage shed. So the Costa Mesa guys went to the shed, at, and this was at the time she disappeared, during that time frame, some three years previous, and they were able to use a, uh, a forensic chemical called luminol. It's a spray, a chemical spray that reacts to blood, and it glows once it contacts uh, the blood and, and this storage shed, obviously, once they did that, you could see a lot of blood had been there. So we determined through that that Denise had actually been in that storage shed because the DNA matched her, the blood. Well, what we found in examining the body was that there were two different impressions on her skull. One of the impressions was a very circular, indented impression that looked like a textbook 
hammer imprint that you would see. The other one was more linear, meaning it was more in length and narrow and very uh, much noticeable in the skull. What we found at the house was a hammer that had some what appeared to be blood and tissue later to be blood and tissue confirming that of Denise's through DNA and a nail bar, a pry bar, which had blood and tissue on it that was matching the DNA of Denise. So what I believed was Famolaro, whether he was in his police uniform, had his abduction kit, stopped to render aid, or what appeared to her, he had stopped to render aid. He tried to abduct her. She may have struggled. He hit her with the hammer. I don't think that was the, the blow that killed her. Uh, he took her to his vehicle, uh, and I think he drug her because the back of her shoes that we recovered from the residents showed the back of the heels were, were rubbed off as they were drug across the pavement, I believe. And then he took her to this storage unit he had. We collected evidence of sexual assault. And I believe that's when he probably at some point, you know, whether it was real quick or sometime later, then used the nail bar to kill her. Her parents were stunned. I looked for her up till the, I think the day she was found, I was, you know, I, I hadn't given up, but when she was, found it was final there was there was, there was she was never going to come back we were never going to be able to find her and it was all over then Denise Huber was one piece of a puzzle authorities struggled to put together it begs the question this is not he didn't know Denise and this seems to be a crime of opportunity the the question that everybody has is do you believe there are more victims out there I do. Um, I don't think this was the first time he, he had done something like this. We had interviewed some other girls that knew him that uh, it was very troubling interviews on how he treated them, what, what he had done to them. Um, one girl felt she escaped from being killed by him. She had to run from him. Detectives would find driver's licenses of other girls inside John's home. They started reaching out to them and realized John had been a predator for years. We did talk to one girl who uh, was a prostitute. He had taken her out into some remote area outside of Phoenix, and she said she had to fight to get out of the car and run into the desert to escape from being killed. She had never reported it to the police, but we had her driver's license because she had left her purse in the car. And you found her license in his house? Yes, we found the license in the house and actually were able to find her still living in Phoenix. How many other licenses of other girls or women did you find? You know, I don't remember the total, but it, it was probably eight to 12, somewhere around there, I think. Okay. And, and a lot of different clothing, female clothing, dresses, underwear, shoes. Some of them looked like they'd been there for a while. Even more haunting, what they found underneath the house. I had talked to some uh, girl who he had dated who said he was obsessed with that room under the house. Um, and I think her term to me was, it was like a dungeon. So it was just a bizarre little room he dug out down there. But nothing. No. No. Um, and I thought I read something that dogs got a scent. You know, we excavated in there. We had some dogs that alerted in an area of this, this dungeon or whatever you want to call it. And uh, we dug down maybe just a couple feet and we came across a, uh, a, a sheet of plywood. And we dug the plywood up and there was nothing under it. But we still to this day don't know why he would bury a sheet of plywood a couple feet under the dirt there. Authorities never found any other bodies, but Sheriff Masher doesn't believe someone like John Famolaro only strikes once. I do believe there's other victims and I'd like to know what, who they are, where they are, what happened to, what them? Happened to them. Famolaro now sits on death row in California. He confessed to the crime, so there was never a trial. Denise's parents offered Jack and Elaine Court thousands of dollars in reward money, but they felt they couldn't take it. 
people sent in uh, letters from um, California. This one was in 1994. I would like to suggest that the people contribute to the reward fund to Elaine Canelia and Jack Court, who were instrumental in bringing Denise Huber tragedy to an end. I'm enclosing $50, and I would hope that many would follow. If not, please forward this check to them. Sincerely, Dorothy Riley of Laguna Hills, California. Dennis and Ione have always asked, why Denise? Why did this happen to their daughter? They may never know for sure, but just recently, nearly 25 years later, they got a letter in the mail from a stranger. I wish I could find the letter. Do you know where the letter is, Dennis? I think I could almost find it. The sender, a former friend of John Famolaro. In the letter, the friend wrote John had been dating a woman in 1991 who broke up with him, and that made him angry. This was shortly before Denise went to that concert. The friend included his phone number in the letter, so Denise's parents called him, and he told them more about John's ex-girlfriend. She looked almost just very much. They said they could have been twins. She looked a lot like her. And same cut of hair. Same kind of car and all of that. Same make, model, color of car that Denise drove. So they felt it might have been a mistaken identity or whatever, maybe when he saw all that, it just made him snap. You, know, snap. you know, we don't know that part of it. And you just learned this last year? Yeah, yeah. After 20 some years, he sent the letter. That's, that was so amazing, a total shock. Right, but you know what? It has helped me because I realized that, you know, there was a reason, possibly, you know, Decades later, it was enough to give Denise Huber's parents the closure they so desperately longed for, as the cold storage killer now awaits execution. I'm journalist Brianna Whitney. True Crime Arizona, the podcast, is hosted by me and produced by Sergio Hernandez. To hear our latest podcasts and case investigations, subscribe on any of these platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, and Stitcher.